This episode of Salmon Cast is sponsored by Wild for Salmon. Wild caught Alaskan seafood direct from our store to your door since 2004. Order now at wildforsalmon.com and use the promo code PODCAST at checkout and you'll get 10% off your first order. That's wildforsalmon.com, promo code PODCAST at checkout. Okay, welcome to Salmon Cast. Today we're going to do a two part series. Um, all about salmon, um, specifically, and we're going to start with a conversation around um, the organic, um, kind of a broader conversation about organic food, but specifically in relation to salmon, and it's um, people have the question to us regularly on our website, and we have customers asking, is salmon organic? Um, and so Steve, what do you, uh, want to start the conversation at, um, when you talk to people and they're asking you that question, where do you typically start when you're explaining to them, um, kind of how organic is labeled in the United States and then how salmon relates to that? Yeah, sure. Um, no, we get this question a lot over time. And I basically, you know, started off with wild salmon does not have the certification of organic and that organic salmon is a label that has been developed by the organic society pretty much as a marketing tool. And the reason wild salmon doesn't get to be labeled as organic is because it's wild and nobody knows what they're eating. Um, So really interesting because you have wild salmon roaming the North Pacific, um, eating all wild proteins that are not necessarily, um, tainted by humans in the sense of the food that like the farm raised salmon is being fed. And, uh, but yet they, they don't get that, um, level of, um, documentation that they're organic. So the farm raised salmon is, does, is it possible to get farm raised salmon labeled as organic? Yeah, you can you can definitely buy it. There um the farm raised companies are always looking for ways to use um organic feed and more natural feed um so that way when they're they label it it's not, you know, it doesn't have dye in it. They're using um algae that has a, a red tint to it that's tinting the flesh so i mean everybody's trying to figure out being that aquaculture is such a big market space how to you know develop the best salmon how do you think it would be like what's the best rule of thumb that you would advice that you would give the consumer like if they're looking to um if they see a package in the grocery store of farm raised organic salmon versus wild caught Alaskan salmon, what avenues do you, would you recommend people look at when they're trying to say, I want to eat wild caught, not necessarily organic, but wild caught. How do you, how would you recommend they go about um, vetting those things when they're looking at a piece of fish? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, anybody probably listening to this podcast is interested in wild fish and basically you want to start with looking for wild and and not you know um, not interested in farm. So always look for wild. Look for wild from a known producer. Um, small fisheries. You know the the smaller and the closer you get to the fishermen, the better control you have. The more you go corporate and bigger brands, and I feel like the less control is there and the potential for. Um, the quality to not be the same. Cool. Um, just to kind of expand the conversation a little bit, because you have a background from an early, for your early years in butchering, when people are talking about like wild food or like knowing where their food comes from, I think like there's like two parts to the organic discussion. So there's the, um, what your food was fed (laughs) 
and like knowing where it comes from like there's two pieces there like like that connection so can you talk just a little bit about like your lifestyle now and growing up in regards to like the food that you've always eaten and your connection to the food yeah no definitely i mean it's the main thing that probably got us from being a fisherman to seeing this the wild protein that we had and then realizing how important it was to to get it into your diet um growing up my father had a custom butcher shop in our backyard so we just had a a garage that was converted into a, a butcher shop and we'd butcher people's pigs and chickens and um, whatever they brought and um so growing up you know we never went to the store to buy meat poultry um and then we would go to the the beach and fish uh so we always had all of the proteins covered from our own backyard for say so it wasn't until i really got into college and moved out of the house that i realized the dilemma that people are, face every day when they go into the grocery store and i can i can vividly remember like walking through the aisle you know in my early 20s which may seem silly that i had not had to like go buy chicken <laughs> until i was in my mid-20s probably at a grocery store when i was living in idaho and it was really an eye-opener because I, I realized at that point how blessed i was by having the ability to have you know pasture raised pork um you know small small farm beef chicken at my fingertips all the time and then as we stepped into the salmon sales business, it became um, very obvious the dilemma that customers were faced when they're coming to the farmer's market and talking to you about it and the way that they have to shop and that they don't have that benefit. And so when I think about this whole organic thing, you know, really to me and our lifestyle and the way that we continue to bring food into the into the freezer is you know through a hunting gathering um fishing approach and then if we need to buy something we go directly to somebody that we know that's raising beef or a lamb you know we trade a, a lamb for a box of salmon every year to a, a local family and um you know there's no doubt in my mind the way that they're raising their lambs and it's just a really kind of clean approach to avoiding the mainstream issues. So it's like, I guess that's what I wanted to, to say or, or bring the point out is like the meat and poultry and seafood that you're consuming regularly, while it's not stamped with an organic stamp, I mean – would you consider it that you still eat organic even if it's not given that title? Oh, I think it's easy to say that, you know, in my, in my mind, we eat beyond organic. Um, because when you go to the organic side of things, you know, it's they're always trying to figure out how to, and especially when you look at, I think, more so animal proteins or fish proteins versus um lettuce you know i think lettuce is the, you know the vegetables are, are done really well but on the food side of things um that they're feeding these animals you know they're always trying to come up with like i said the the best feed supplements and ways to raise them that they can list them as organic but it really in my mind the dilemma is the omega threes versus the omega sixes. So when you have a, a farm raised salmon that's fed a lot of um, grains, it has a higher omega six and the, I'm not an expert in this field, but the different, the ratio between the omega threes versus the omega six is very important in the, um, the reasons why you should eat seafood and how it helps to lower heart disease and cancer and, all of those um, claims that are out there is basically because you're eating a wild product that is eating the right things. Mm -hmm. So when you go and get farm raised, it's typically farm raised that is certified organic. It's typically um, fed more omega sixes. And I think that that's where 
a lot of the conversation with our customers have gone in the past is really around like getting your head wrapped around eating wild or eating local where you know what's going into that product because large scale aquaculture doesn't have the benefits of a small farm and the abilities to you know kind of nurture and feed the animals the right thing right and it kind of goes to like a similar path when you talk about like free range chicken or free range poultry how the definition of free range has been proven that like could be just a small two by two or four by four um, little area that they're that the chickens are roaming in and bam then you get the stamp of a free range and I think that like that's the difference I think that is more important to the conversation than when people ask oh is salmon organic is more like wanting to know where your food comes from and knowing the difference between when your food comes from a wild place and is a wild caught or wild harvested protein source that it's i think the way that you put it was was good in that like it's feeding itself naturally like with what the resources it has available to it to nourish itself um where do you think like right now in your life if you were to inventory it What's your breakdown of meat to poultry to seafood on a regular basis? Yeah, it's funny you say that. I just brought in uh, 10 pounds of smoked elk jerky that I just made. And it's basically I gave some to almost all the employees today because we have too much red meat at this point. Um, We've consistently um, have been transitioning into more fish. And I see that to be a bigger part of our diet it's probably roughly i would say now 50 percent of our diet you know is fish growing up it was all meat you know we were butchering pigs and i mean we still butcher two pigs a year some of that goes to the boat and to feed the crew but i find myself eating less um meat proteins was your was your avenue as a kid for seafood like that was the only thing you got at the store were you still finding um, like wild sources for um, when you when you had fish at home? No, we didn't have any idea about the okay. difference between wild and farm-raised. Right. And to be honest, we only ate seafood when we would, like around the holidays okay. or if we caught it at the shore in the summertime. Right. You know, it wasn't something that was a, a normal staple. We, we had a lot of pork, chicken growing up. That was kind of the main things. I mean, we would put up like 250 chickens a year for... Mm-hmm. Um, the family, you know, there was six of us. So, you know, you go through a lot of chickens. Right. I'm not a big chicken fan. Right. <laughs> at this point. Do you, do you guys have chickens? We've only got uh, some layers. So we okay. just got about 10 that are we okay. have for laying. And then right now we have two pigs that are, the we'll, we'll butcher those okay. in the spring here. And so, like, would you say that the comment you made earlier about, like, moving more towards seafood, um, how do you go about, because I think this is an interesting conversation for those out there that are interested in like harvesting and or gathering their protein sources. Um, how do you go about looking at your year? Like when do you start and say, okay, this is when I know my freezer is going to get low. And then how do you personally like gauge, here's my strategy for the year of how I'm going to stock it? Yeah, well, I mean... When you, the hunter side of it is, you know, some of that's luck, whether you, you <laughs> end up getting an animal or not. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, like this year we were, we were heavy with, um, elk, deer and bear because my father-in-law was successful and my daughter Ava got two deer. So then I just kind of pulled back cause we didn't need any more. And, um, I didn't even get a deer this year cause I, we didn't need it. We've got those, the two pigs that are being raised. Um, one will go to the boat, one will kind of stay at the house for just our consumption. And some of that will also be split off. Like two of our neighbors will come over and help me butcher. Mm -hmm. And then I just give them some meat and trade. Okay. So I really, I kind of like that program because it, it intertwines friends and family, Right. you know, um, when you're making we're butchering or processing just like this weekend, we put up 200 pounds of hard bologna 
which will be dried for the next three weeks, and then then we put it in the freezer. But there was three families there of uh, friends and three friends groups that were there helping make. So they brought their deer meat in, and then we just kind of got a little butcher shop in my garage. We put it all up, and it it takes us only like six hours to do it. It goes quicker than if I was just going to do 50 pounds for myself. And, um, and that way that kind of like, we know that about 50 pounds of that lasts us for the whole season. And when we, when I go to the boat in the, in the spring, I kind of take anything excess. Mm -hmm. Like that's the opportunity I have to clean, um, my freezers down. And then the other side of it is, is I've got lots of friends around that are, that are happy to take you know, some stuff. So we'll barter, you know, somebody will do something a favor, right. Throw them a pack of pork chops. My, right. my sister just had a baby. We put together a wild seafood box and like almost one of everything that we had in the freezer and sent it off to them to fill right. their freezer. I think that that's like something that's interesting to me is like a lot of people, or at least that I've noticed, like when you bring up the concept of bartering, like they're interested in it, although they're not like, can they never considered it before like versus the like the value of what you can provide them in trade of something versus like oh i want you to do this i i remember a story like when i was younger my grandfather used to install wells um and he went and did a well for a guy and he didn't have enough money to pay for like the pump installation so he gave my grandfather a gun and in, in exchange for doing oh, the, wow. the the well and like it was like it was not thought of as being like is like my grandfather's like yeah like I'll, I'll do that and like that gun he never sold it like it's still in our family it's still a, a you know a thing that we have like from back in the 1970s that just this barter trade and right. turns into like I think that people don't a lot of people don't live in that space anymore because we're such in a in a culture of like like money 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 and the value of an actual product that you can trade is you know and it provides that provides variety yeah and i don't even think it's like the money driven driven part i think it's the isolation of of people and families as we're fragmented mm -hmm. across the country right. like I live right where i grew up so i know right. everybody and everybody knows me right and so we've got these long-term relationships with friends that you, you know, have been dealing with for 20, 30 years. And I think that that's the difference that I see because when I approach the idea of bartering with people, you can just see that they don't have that within their, their space. They don't have other people that are on that same page because they're fragmented and they're not, they don't have that friend base. Right. That's, that's almost like friend slash family. You yeah. Know? Um, there's, just like I said, numerous families that every year we get together, whether it's pressing apple cider mm -hmm. or it's making hard bologna or it's butchering the pigs right? Um, that show up on a Saturday. We spend the day together kind of like have, having fun, putting up food, and everybody is super excited about it because it's they know the quality of it. So mm -hmm. it's just like it's camaraderie. It's good food. It's just like feeding the soul kind of in different levels. Are you, are you enjoying the, uh, the butchering now that it's not like you grew up doing it? So is it something that like you enjoy doing or is it more of like, do you view it as a chore? No, I, I really, I really like it. And I really like the idea of, you know, my kids that, you know, Ava's nine and, and Tommy's six. So like they're in there butchering, you know, I get my, my father comes up and helps us make scrapple. Um, which is, you know, most people don't know what that is, but that's <laughs> the, you know, the, all the bones and, and head meat and, and organ meat of this, the, um, pig then boiled off into a broth and turned back into, um, a, uh, not a paste, but a, you, you put flour in, thicken it and then like it, a mash. Yeah. Then it dry, it, it gets stiffer and then you cut it and fry it. But, uh, so like I've been making that forever and you when you make it you scrape the kettle you know you got this big old cast iron kettle that i drag <laughs> out of the barn and the kids scrape you know everybody it was like as a kid it was we got to eat whatever's left in this you know right 30 gallon kettle and it was what you lived for it's why you got up at five in the morning to right. start butchering pigs right and so as i try to instill that into the into our kids it's something that we we continuously do and so i like it from that point of view i think what you need to do is figure out the systematic approach so it's not a chore. 
Right. right? Like, the, and that's why I invite people over to help right. because I'd rather trade some product to get some help and get it done in a, in a shorter amount of time than to have like this big daunting task of, Oh, I got to butcher two pigs by myself. And we won't, we won't name any names, but, uh, because they may be listening, but when you're inviting other people over to, to do the butchering of either their animal or, mm-hmm. or just to participate in the process, like what's the percentage of things that you think people are actually like learning and are taking those skills and going to utilize them themselves versus like those who have no interest in <laughs> in learning how to do it. Well, I think everybody comes with the interest of learning. I think when you go to the point of raising the animal, butchering it and kind of having all the tools and knowledge to kind of do that is where it falls off. So they're really interested in helping and everybody wants to come and help, but when if you just said hey like i'm not doing it anymore you need to do your own Mm -hmm. it would probably fall off because it gets more daunting right you know right but i like to challenge myself to things like um one 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 interesting thing i think about people when they get into the butchering side side of things is is they really feel like they need all the bells and whistles to make it happen so right like bandsaw um splitting saw just all this stuff that costs a lot of money and so one thing that I've done is I've kind of gone back old school. Mm-hmm. So like when I cut my spare ribs off, I use a hand saw. So I just use my wood saw that my grandfather gave me. Wow. And yeah, you could go buy a new saw, um, but it's the same thing with a meat cleaver. Like I can cut my pork chops with a meat cleaver. Right. And they're not like as beautiful as a bandsaw, but you get pretty good at it. <laughs> right. And you realize you don't need this, you know, $1,500, $2,000 bandsaw that you only use once a year. Right. Um, and I try to teach people that. And it's the same way with the deer. Like, all you do really need is a meat grinder of some sort and the rest mm-hmm. can d- be done with a knife and a handsaw. Right. Yeah. I think that's interesting because it's, it's kind of that way with like getting into any type of like outdoor activity, whether it's fishing, hunting, camping, you know, like people always have, whether it is an excuse or it's a, you know, or a legitimate fear, like, Oh, it's too expensive. I don't know where to start. Like, I think that the fact that, you show people through that process that like, you don't need a lot, like you don't need a farm. You don't need, um, you know, this custom equipment that you can do this, you know, at your place. And I think I, I kind of wanted to talk about that just for a minute because I think that it's a good uh, resource for people is like, if people out there listening are interested in getting started to like develop a, um, a system for their family to consume like wild protein, um, you know, s- bartering, sustainable food, knowing where their food comes from. How would you recommend someone who's, let's say, you know, they don't have land, right? They have minimal space, let's say an acre or less. Um, what would your suggestion be as to how they get started into like, doing it themselves and how to source that stuff. Yeah. So I think the first step is to, to get a freezer to make sure that you can, you can stock up a little bit. And then depending on the size of the land you can, and your resources, you know, you can just start with your, you know, your poultry proteins and get 20 chickens. So, I mean, it's really easy to build a little fence, makeshift house and do that. All you need is a pot of hot water and you can hand pluck. I mean, that's how we kind of start it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really, again, it's daunting when you think about it. But if you get, so you raise 20 chickens and you get your buddy and you say, hey, I'll give you five if you come over and help me Saturday morning. Right. And then you just kind of like make it into um, a fun event. And again, I think that it's something that we're missing in society is like that um, communication around food and putting up food. Right. Um, I think there's a lot in our psyche that like, it should exist. It shouldn't just be an activity that you go to the supermarket and you look at price tags and cellophane and plastic. It should be really more, um, family oriented, you know, um, camaraderie type activity, uh, of putting up food to nourish our families. So, you know, you can start there and then numerous small, there's other guys that'll, or other families that'll be, have product like be raising a cow or, a couple pigs and you can just say, Hey, can I come help for some exchange for some pork? Mm-hmm. And 
you know, then you get your feet wet, you get to see what it's like. You could then size up how much ground you have. I mean, we just got some poly wire, a couple plastic, you know, uh, fiberglass posts. And I, you know, I always try to be a minimalist for fun. Like, I, right. you know, you could, I could just be like, Hey, I want to build a little shed. It's going to cost a thousand bucks. I'm going to do it. And because I want to raise these pigs. But instead what I did was I knew that my father had an old truck cap, just a fiberglass truck cap. So I use that. So the wow. pigs just crawl underneath this fiberglass truck. It didn't cost me a dime. Right. You know, I probably have $30 in stakes and wire and the horse fence, you know, fence or doubles, but you mm-hmm. could, you know, you can get where I'm going with it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like I'm reusing an old truck cap mm-hmm. and I didn't have to build anything. Um, and the day I want to quit doing it, I could just, you know, right. get rid of it. Right. But, uh, it, it's just like coming up with ways like that to break the barrier mm-hmm. of entry and find other people out there and families that are doing that, f- you know, make friends with them and, Go have a good time on Saturday and butcher a pig, cut some pork chops up, fry it in the frying pan at lunchtime. And, you know, um, you just get started that way. Oh, cool. I, uh, I have two other questions kind of al- along the similar lines. What vegetables would you recommend people starting with in a garden to compliment to best complement? Um, let's say wild caught. If someone starts with purchasing wild caught salmon um, they've got a couple of chickens that they're, they're working with. And let's say like, they're going to maybe barter or purchase like part of a beef cow. Like what vegetables would you recommend that are very versatile that you found that can kind of complement some of those, um, protein sources? Yeah. So here, here in the Northeast, um, in Pennsylvania, you know, best that I find is I've got a really, in, um, large asparagus patch. Okay. Um, I put that in 10 years ago and it just, you know, we are able to, it's about 30 yards long by about three feet wide and it puts up enough asparagus that we can then blanch it and freeze it for all winter. So right before I go to Alaska, you know, late May, we're always picking asparagus every day, blanching every other night or something. You know, it just takes 30 minutes Mm -hmm. to do a couple batches. You put it in Ziplocs, freeze it. Um, and then we, we have raised beds and I like to do, um, kale, Swiss char, and my wife likes, um, beans, string beans. And those are kind of, I would say the main, um, we always buy our Brussels sprouts from a local farmer because I, my luck at raising them is not so good. <laughs> and they're kind of like happen in the fall. Um, another thing I do is some of the, at the farmer's markets, the vendors will have an excess of like spinach in the, in the fall. Mm -hmm. So I'll just make a deal with them to take like a couple boxes and then I come home and just blanch it and put it in Ziplocs and freeze it. And then I have spinach for the whole season. So I just take, you know, maybe three hours on a Saturday afternoon and I help them by getting rid of their excess Mm -hmm. and get it at a a discount. Typically I'll trade her some salmon Mm -hmm. and then put it up and then you have it. And I really think, that if you're going to do a garden, like blanching your greens and putting them up is the way to go. Okay. And the other thing you mentioned there, it's interesting because I didn't even know this, that like the raised beds, which is actually like more convenient for those that don't have a lot of space, that you can build a little garden bed um, even if you don't have like a tract of, of land to work off of for your garden. Um, have you found that that, what you what was your purpose of why you guys decided to do raised beds versus in the ground well the first year we had two gardens that were probably like when we, the first year after we bought the piece of property we're on we had two raised beds or sorry two gardens that were about 30 feet by 60 feet long and i've got this big tiller that my grandfather or jen's grandfather gave us and i'm out there tilling it all up and i i put up we planted 100 tomato plants and thought like this is awesome and then we had so much excess at that point that I realized like, whoa, you know, it's just Jen and I at the time, but I'm like, you don't need that much. So again, in my, in my goal to be more efficient and use less, like I gave my rototiller to my father, he's got a bigger garden and I just use raised beds, which I build out of logs. Really. I just quartered logs and nailed them together 
Um, so I didn't have to buy anything. And uh, they'll last for like six, eight years and they'll start to rot and you just rip them up, you know, throw them in the compost, you know, take another tree and build a new set versus getting pressure treated wood or like all the different questions. So I think people get hung up on the, the fact that it needs to be precise mm-hmm. and I'm not that way. I'm very instinctual. So I just make it work and right. kind of build it well. And, but I don't get hung up if the corners don't match. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Start with what you have. Just get started. I think that's a good, um, to wrap up the salmon portion. What, um, what quantity of well two questions what quantity of salmon would you recommend someone start with if they're new to wild caught seafood and then what other varieties of seafood that that they could purchase from wild for salmon would you start with if you're new to it yeah well i mean if you're new to it i think you should just start sampling um you know just by the portion size if you're able to come to the store if you're buying online i would put together um, an order big enough to get you to the 150 mark. So that way you get free shipping and you can kind of pick that variety, figure out what you like and what your family prefers. And then you can kind of what I would do in the way we really designed the business out of the gate with our buying clubs and bulk kind of boxes is once you realize like, Hey, I, we really go through 20 pounds of sockeye, then you kind of make that as a one-time purchase in and then you stock up, you keep it in the freezer, you've got it at the best, the best price per pound, mm-hmm. and you always have it there. It also inspires you to having it in the freezer, like for me, is, is I never feel the urge to go shopping right. because I always have stuff. Right. I mean, and Jen goes, so it's kind of a little bit of a, I mean, we have to go shopping. Yeah. Right? But, and she handles that. But on the same token, we really don't, we're not, driven to go on a, on a, there's always something there that if you don't make it to the store that day, you're still going to have something other than peanut butter jelly for dinner. Right. Yeah. And by putting up your own stuff, you end up with all the different pieces and like lamb shank is comes to mind. It, you know, I had lamb shank left over from the year prior. Cause I was like, I don't know what to do with it. And then finally I'm like, you got to deal with it. Right. You know, it's a year old. You got to <laughs> deal with it. New lamb just showed up. Right. And so quick looked up a recipe cooked it up, you know, braised it and, uh, slow cooked it for a while. It was excellent. And I think that helps you use the unwanted parts or right. what people think is like not so good parts. Um, and it, it challenges your cooking skills. It kind of like personally, it, it toughens you up a little bit to be like, right. well, I'm not going to be picky about, um, only eating certain parts, right. You know, like we eat the whole animal for what it is and enjoy every piece of it. Yeah. Great. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to tune in next week um, and we'll continue our conversation. Uh, We're going to get into the different species of salmon and talk a little bit about what the differences are there. Um, And make sure to like, subscribe and give us a comment. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.